Morning. Morning. It's good to gather together in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Amen. I'm excited that our uh, governor is lifting some of the restrictions um, on uh, restaurants and all, and we're kind of working off of that as guidelines and whatnot in our church gatherings. So we'll thankfully be able to move towards having more people gathered together. Um, hopefully, as you entered in, you grabbed a bulletin there in the basket back there. There's also hand sanitizer. And there's masks. We do want to um, be attentive to those directions and care for one another in these ways. So if you come in and you're like, I just touched tons and tons of things with my hands. I don't even know what that was. Then maybe just, there's one over there. There's actually one up here on the table all over. And grab a mask if you didn't uh, bring one with you. Um, hopefully you also grabbed a bulletin. Um, if you're watching online, it's our hope that we can be as sort of interactive with you as possible. And so we hope that you maybe printed off the bulletin from our uh, website. Or if not, maybe you can follow along on our Facebook comments and you can participate as much as possible in our worship as we gather together uh, to worship the Lord. Um, I say this regularly, but I think it's really, really important, um, largely for you who are at home, uh, that if we're standing, try standing. If we're singing, even as awkward as it is, try to sing out, sing loud. Uh, we're going to sing the doxology, and I heard from Chris earlier that his kids know it really well, and sometimes they stand on their, the edge of their couch and sing it out loud. So maybe you need to do that. Just stand and sing loud, even if you're by yourself. Um, enter in as much as you are able. That's what we long for, for we who are here to do that. Enter in with all of our being, our heart, mind, and soul, and strength. And that's what we hope for you who are not physically present with us. Uh, with that in mind, please stand, and we will hear this call to worship from our Lord from Psalm 57. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we, uh, we know that it's true now that indeed your, your uh, glory, O oh Lord, is among all the peoples. Uh, Lord, you have spread your fame among all the nations. Lord, we hear from so many different backgrounds, and we think even today as we enter into the story of Daniel, of how you were doing that in so many different ways throughout the history of your people. God, we pray that as we've gathered together here in your name, that you would be present with us, that your glory would be among us, God, that as we sing to you, as we hear from you, as we taste of you, all these things would be saturated with the reality of you with us, the Spirit within us, Jesus singing over us. God, be present today with us, we ask. Receive our praise. Receive our prayers. Receive us, we ask, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's sing together. Sustain it. 
praise to the Lord who doth prosper thy work and defend thee. Surely his goodness and mercy here daily attend thee. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do. If with his love he befriend thee. Praise to the Lord, oh let all that is in me adore him. All that hath life and breath come now with praises before. great song. Amen. Let the amen, right? Amen. Y'all may be seated. We are going to confess our sins. Uh, knowing how our Lord is deserving of all praise and glory and how we fall short of giving him all praise and all glory, him our entire lives, we're going to go to the Lord and confess our sins. Uh, my children have been memorizing some verses, and this was their verse for the week, Exodus 22 and 3. And in this, these two verses put together, we see the gospel. We see that the Lord saves his people, and it's out of that salvation that they're called to live in a certain way. It's not that you, to earn it, or not to earn the salvation. This is, listen how this goes, right? It's because of what he did that they live in such a way. But we go to the Lord and we say, Lord, we know what you've done, and yet we fail to live it up to this standard, and so we confess. But I want you to hear this call to confession from Exodus 20. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me. So let's go to the Lord and confess our sins, confess that we often put other things before him and then rest upon his grace. We're going to sing first, Create in me a clean heart.
Let's confess together now. Heavenly Father, Father, we confess confess that you are the the one and only true God. Forgive Forgive us for our forgetful, forgetful, disrespectful, and self-seeking hearts. We have have worshipped the gods of prosperity, success, beauty, power, and comfort. We have prioritized our own immediate needs before others and before you. Rather than seek to conform our lives to your commands, we have sought to understand your commands according to the ways we want to live our lives. Forgive us for denying your power, your goodness, and your authority in our lives. Now, would you stand and hear these good words of forgiveness and peace? These are from the Lord to you this morning. This is from Isaiah 57. This is verses 15 and 18. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place. And also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive. That means give life, right? To give life. The spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. I have seen his way, but I will heal him. I will lead him and restore comfort to him. Brothers and sisters, this is good news for you. And I declare to you that in Christ Jesus, our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thanks be to God for his grace to us and his peace to us. Now, uh, keeping uh, attuned to social distancing and all that, I'm going to invite you to pass the peace of Christ to one another. So that might mean just yell across the room or something. Peace the Lord be with you. And also with you. Amen. Greet one another. Our kids, our kids are Hi, peace. My mask is over there. <laughs> uh, Brothers and sisters, let's get back together uh, and sing, sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let's sing that once more. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. My hope. 
is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Darkness hides his lovely face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground. His covenant, His blood, support me in the whelming flood. When, when all around my soul gives way, He then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. On Christ solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Let's sing one more. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Sing 
rest our voices, okay? How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Once more. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Amen. You may be seated, brothers and sisters. Um, for our Living Our Faith time today, I wanted to mention just a few announcements. Um, there are a number of small group studies that are uh, coming back together. Some of them are being formed anew, and uh, most of these, not, maybe not all of them, but most of them are, one of the, the, are ones that you can go to in person or you can kind of zoom in. Uh, just this past week, there's a women's Bible study that started uh, studying 1 Samuel, and that was meeting here it's on, on Wednesdays from 7 to 9. Uh, hopefully you got uh, an email about that or you saw that in the newsletter. And that's one that some people are coming and some people are staying home. Um, so you who are home, I'm looking at you right now, you can still be a part of this stuff, okay? Connect. Um, there's also a study that uh, is at the Prescott studying the book of Revelation, uh, which I think is so daunting and also just really exciting and fun. Uh, that's wonderful. And it'll actually hopefully go along well with the book of Daniel this fall here in our sermon series. Um, also, tomorrow morning, we're actually going to restart our breakfast group. Um, some of you were a part of that that used to meet on Wednesday mornings. We're going to do it on Monday mornings. So you can come here for breakfast from 7 to 8. We'll have eggs and bacon and stuff like that, coffee. And what we're going to ask is that you kind of treat it like a restaurant. Come in, wear your mask while we're hanging out. And when we sit down, we're going to set up a couple tables so people can not be right up in each other's grill, and we can eat, and we can study the scriptures, and we can pray together. Um, <laughs> uh, and then, what else is it? oh, on Tuesday afternoons, actually from four to five, so there was a few people that were like, hey, I'd love to be a part of a Bible study, particularly a guy's Bible study, but that time in the morning doesn't really work for me, and these other times, so let's do something else. So th starting this Tuesday from four to five, so it's a late afternoon, some, of you, some people get off early from their work. We're actually going to be meeting at the Kemper's house. They have an outdoor place where we can hang out, and we're going to study the Word together on Tuesdays. So hopefully you can get connected to our church in those different ways. There's one other thing that's happening that I want to mention, which is this coming Saturday, we're going to do a men's event. We're going to go canoeing on the Yellow Breaches, and then we're having a smoke-off. I put cook-off because it just the alliteration with canoeing and cook-off, it's a smoke-off. And we've got a few different people smoking ribs. And actually, I, I understand we might even have some friends who are like semi-pros. So this can be like legit competition now. Um, and we're going to canoe, and then we're going to hang out and um, judge ribs, uh, which sounds wonderful to me. So those are some things that are happening in our life together, and I just really want to encourage you, uh, do not neglect gathering together. Even if that means like you don't, you don't feel comfortable coming out here or to a small group, get on a Zoom small group. Pay, you know, get connected as much as you are possibly able in this time. Um, it's deeply, deeply important to stay connected to the body of Christ. Um, with that, I want to uh, pray uh, for the children of this church, and uh, I want to especially pray, actually, generally, not for a family, but for those who are starting school right now. I, I feel like the burden right now is on uh, children as they make this transition. So we're going to pray for the children of this church and particularly bring uh, them before the Lord in terms of schooling. So let's pray. Uh, Lord God, we're thankful for the children of this church. We're thankful for the, the little, little ones and for the big ones, those who have gone off to college, um, those who even, uh, I think of Reagan McClamont now, who's heading out to work with Knowles in Wyoming for the semester. College is looking different uh, for lots of folk. Um, high school is looking different. Uh, I think of uh, Daniel James uh, doing online completely. And Logos here is looking different, Lord, uh, wearing masks all the time, uh, children running around still, but staying in their classrooms much more. And 
Some of us have kids at home. Some of us have kids doing part-time at home and part-time at school. God, we pray that you would be with the parents of these children. Uh, be with those whose um, sports has been affected, their relationships with their friends have been affected. God, I pray that they would bring all this before you. And they would find that you're the one who meets them in times of difficulty, that you meet them in the challenges, um, that often, actually, it's in these times where you show up the most and are most uh, obviously present. God, we pray that you would do that in the lives of the children of this church. God, we pray that you would do that in the lives of the parents of this church, that you would equip them as they seek to parent in wisdom and grace, as they seek to instruct their children in the knowledge of your ways. God, we pray for us who have made vows to the people of this church, the children of this church and their baptisms and other ways uh, that we would do all that we can to instill faith in one another, and pr encouraging one another to, to press on in love and good deeds until the day of Christ, Christ's appearing. Uh, Lord, hold the children of this church closely in your arms, we pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, would you give uh, your close attention to the reading of God's Word? Don's going to help me out with some of these. The first reading is from Psalm 137, verses 1 to 4. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there, we hung up our lyres. For there our captors required us of songs, and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's stand and sing the glory of Patri. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Now here, the Old Testament reading, it comes to us from Daniel chapter 1. This is all of Daniel chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, the, king, the, the chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, understanding, learning and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate, and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, and Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths who are your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Test your servants for ten days. Let them be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you. And deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for ten days. At the end of ten days, he was, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. 
So the steward took away their food and the wine they, they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of the time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king spoke with them. And among all of them was found none was and among all of them none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters there were in all of his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. This is the word of the Lord. Four. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Thank you, Don. You may be seated. Okay, I'm just going to say Chris Gazy helped me with this one a little bit. Um, I want you to imagine with me a kid who grows up in Pittsburgh. Of course, he bleeds black and gold. His room is just full of it, like posters all over the place. You look into his drawers, and there's just black and gold clothes. Like for Christmas, what, do, what does he receive? He receives like Steelers jerseys and Penguins hats and, you know, Pittsburgh shirts and stuff like that. That's just his life. Um, his parents grew up in the 70s when the city was known as the city of champions. Oh, I taught you all something, all right? It's still called the city of steel, of steel I think. City of champions. Um, and then he, this, this guy actually, he was in uh, elementary school, and he was a big, big fan when, again, in 2009, it, it, re, it sort of revived that name, the City of Champions, because both the Penguins and the Steelers won the national championships in their respective sports. Um, so this guy is just full of Steelers stuff, right? I mean, you can picture this because I feel like I'm not, you know, I'm not from Pennsylvania and I see these people. Like, black and gold, that's just it, right? Um, it's, uh, it's his life. He goes to Pitt for college. He continues just to wear black and gold during that time, even though their colors somehow didn't match like the rest of the city colors. But then after college, of all places, he gets a job with the Eagles. All right? Um, so what's he do? He's like, no, I'm not taking the job. Well, he, took, he takes the job, right? So what's he do? Does he get all new clothes? I mean, he only has black suits and gold ties, right? What's he going to do? Got to get some blue, some blue right? Or uh, green. Uh, I was thinking of the Phillies. I don't know what's going on here. Um, how does he remain? This is the question. This is the driving question for this guy. How does he remain faithful when he's living in Philly? Now, y'all don't have to deal with that because we're in the middle of those, and you can just kind of choose what you want. You know, Baltimore, Washington, whatever. Harrisburg's like, what everyone, everyone talks about Harrisburg being right in the middle. So you don't have to deal with this, but for this kid, it's like complete agony. Okay, here's what I am suggesting to you, though, is actually this, this might seem like an, a story that you go, okay, I can picture that. And it might seem distant, right? Pittsburgh, Philly. But you know, actually, this is not a very distant thing. It's not a, actually a very distant idea. This is the thing of all kinds of movies. I mean, one of my favorite scenes, and I've used this as an illustration before, is of Andy in Shawshank Redemption, right? Blaring out over the speakers of the, of the prison courtyard the beautiful opera of Mozart. Co sort of just fighting a resistance of assimilation, right? Saying, I'm not going to assimilate to this. Or you can think of plenty of other movies. I'm thinking of Neo and The Matrix and all kinds of other stuff. But this is actually something that we kind of know, this idea of somehow we have to fight assimilation. 
Don't let it get you completely. Um, I was thinking this week, in, in light of this, of some of my favorite places to eat here in Harrisburg, uh, namely Garden Vietnamese, Tacos Mi Tierra, Canlaya. Can I get an amen? Oh, y'all do not know. All right. Um, sorry, we'll, we'll have to do an education in best places to eat in Harrisburg. And but why are these places so great? It's because these people have moved here, and they said, I'm not going to completely sell out. I'm not going to completely give in. I might become a citizen. I might participate in civic life in my neighborhood and all this sort of stuff. But I'm not going to be Taco Bell, right? Everybody knows that Tacos Mitiera is way better than Taco Bell. And why? Because Tacos Mitiera has not totally assimil assimilated into American fast food life. Okay, so think of Daniel. I want you to think of Daniel. And my guess is that when you start thinking about the book of Daniel, if you're a certain age, then what maybe comes to your mind is flannel graph fiery furnace. You know what I'm saying? So that's the image maybe that's in your mind, flannel graph fiery furnace. Maybe when you think of the book of Daniel, what comes to your mind is that time when you were trying to diet and your friend was like, oh, I got some books for you. They're Bible books. Here's the, <laughs> these are actually real book names. The Daniel plan. Here's the Daniel fast. Here's the Daniel diet. So maybe you think, oh, this is, this is like how people use the Bible, the book of Daniel. Maybe you think of that great song, that great song that some people used to sing. I'm kind of kidding. Dare to be a Daniel. Dare to be, I can't sing it. I actually tried to listen to it a few times. I just couldn't get it in my head. Dare to be a Daniel. Dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm. Dare to make it known. Or maybe you remember the time that you were reading through the Bible in a year and you got to the book of Daniel, and you're like, yes, these stories, I love all these stories. And then you got to like the second half of the book, and you're like, apocalyptic confusion all over your head. Don't know what's happening here, right? Okay, so we're going to try to tackle the book of Daniel up until Advent. Um, and I think there's lots of good reasons for us to do that actually right now, sort of in the life of our church, in the life of our world about us. I think there's a lot of good reasons for us to do this. And today we're looking at chapter one, and, and this chapter really does set us up well for the book as a whole. It gets at sort of big themes, and it also guards us against certain sort of ditches that we could fall into. Okay? I want us to consider uh, this uh, chapter today with sort of these big headings. We're going to look at the situation, we're going to look at the confrontation, and then we're going to look at the benediction, okay? Situation, confrontation, benediction. So here's... Here's how the book starts, the situation. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. All right, there's, there's a number of things going on here. One is it's just situating us in terms of dating, timing, okay? Um, we're talking about uh, 603, 605 B.C., okay? Which is, this is actually the first of sort of the Babylonian conquest that results in the Babylonian exile. This isn't the end of it when actually the city is essentially raised, right? Put, put, uh, put to the ground. But this is the beginning of it. This is the beginning of it. Um, we're dealing with a conflict between Babylon and the southern kingdom of Israel because, as you might know, the northern 12, 10 tribes of Israel were actually done away with by the Assyrians back in 721. Um, so some of the previous kings of Israel had tried to make treaties with Babylon, but now Babylon, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, actually comes to Jerusalem and he besieges it. Um, it's important that you see here that the king that's mentioned, the, the king of Judah here, the, the southern uh, kingdom, is Jehoiakim. Um, why that's important is because Jehoiakim is a bad dude. He's a bad dude. We learn a few things about him in the book of Jeremiah, who's writing at the same time period. Um, one of the things we learn in one chapter, um, chapter 36, is that Jehoiakim actually has one of the scrolls from Jerusalem or from Jeremiah, and he burns it. He's like, I don't want anything to do with this stuff that's calling me to repentance and to faithfulness. Uh, what we learn also, actually elsewhere, uh, in Jeremiah 26, is that there's another prophet who calls Jehoiakim to repentance, and he has him executed. Okay, so Daniel situating us with what's happening right here with Jehoiakim is an important thing. Um, according to rabbinic literature, uh, Jehoiakim had lived an incestuous relationship with his mother, daughter-in-law, and his stepmother, 
and was actually just sort of in the habit, now this is not scripture itself, but this is rabbinic literature, he was in the habit of killing guys whose, ho- whose wives he wanted. Okay, this is Jehoiakim. This is not a good dude. Um, one of the important lessons that's happening here is that God is actually keeping his covenant in terms of judging his people. Okay? God is actually keeping his covenant by judging his people. You see, there are always these two parts of the covenant. There's the covenant blessing and the covenant curses. And God did not take following him sort of like Jehoiakim supposedly was kind of doing, not really slash killing his prophets lightly. He would judge them, and he did judge them. You did not want God's judgment to fall on you. Okay, so, um, so part of what's happening with this, with this besieging of Jerusalem is the reality of covenant curses falling on the people of God. As I mentioned, uh, eventually, Jerusalem would be completely razed to the ground and the temple completely destroyed. But at this first stage, it actually as a way to appease Nebuchadnezzar, Jehoiakim pays him off. And he pays him off with large sums from the Jerusalem treasury and, and actually large and important uh, vessels from the temple itself and then he says, oh, and take all of these people to be your servants and your slaves. They're the best, they're the brightest, they'll help you out. He's essentially paying off what he knows is going to come, which is, the, which is his own destruction. Um, this is what happens in verses 2 through 4. Let me read you this again. I'm not going to read the whole chapter again as we go on, but I'm going to read you some of this stuff. This is verse 2. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Aphpenes, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both the royal family and of the nobility, used without blemish of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace, and to teach them the literature of the language of the Chaldeans. So here's the thing. The glory days of Israel are gone. They're actually long gone. I mean, sometimes I think when we think of like the kings of Israel, the, two, the, the, the kings that come to mind are like Saul, David, Solomon, right? This is a long, that's long gone at this point. That's actually about 400 years gone is David at this point. Um, it's sort of like thinking about George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. Okay, so instead you have this foreign empire that comes and it besieges the city now, this is, here, here's what's important for you to understand, is that Jerusalem is the place, is, is Zion. It's the place where actually God met with his people. The temple was there. God himself would meet with his people there, right? When Solomon dedicates the temple, the Shekinah glory cloud comes and it descends upon the temple. So if Jerusalem itself is being besieged and actually vessels from the very temple of God are being taken out to sort of pay off this, you know, this, this guy who's besieging, this, this foreign king, then the, the thing that's actually happening is for the people there, they're saying, where is God? What has he done? Has he actually completely left us alone? Is our sin so great that he is just gone, gone? So it's not just the temple thing here that we learn about that's taken, but the royal family and the nobility. It's part of God's people and the leaders of God's people that were being taken away. Now, one of the other things I've been teaching my kids recently is Genesis chapter 12, right? Where Abraham is called, and he's called, and it says, I'm going to bless you, and I'll make you a great nation so that you will be a blessing. That the whole story of Israel is caught up in this idea that God is not going to let sin overcome everything, but he's going to do something through the nation of Israel for the sake of the whole world. And what you have here is the uh, royalty, the nobility being taken away. What you're thinking is God is gone from his temple, worship is destroyed, he's left it, we're, and our own people are being scattered. This whole thing, this whole project called Israel, which was supposed to be blessed, and through its blessing, the whole world will be blessed. Essentially, the hope of the whole world is being dashed right here. That's the situation that you find yourself in. God abandoning you, covenant curses coming down in such a way that the nation itself is essentially gone. It is as bad as things could possibly have been if you were living at that time and you were in the southern kingdom. They've fallen, their people were taken away, their artifacts of the temple were taken away. God has given up. 
is the idea. Sin reigns. Um, this gets us to this second part that helps us understand not just uh, this chapter, but the whole book. And there's a confrontation that happens here. There's a confrontation that happens in this chapter. Because immediately after these youth are brought to Babylon, the thing that we primarily read about in this chapter is their assimilation. Their assimilation. Um, I mean, I imagine that they were, as sort of all refugees are, they're worried, right? They're going to this new place. Are they going to find jobs? Are they going to have friends? Are they going to learn the language? Are they going to be able to make it, right? And they're worried, as refugees would be worried. What will they find? Will they make it? Um, they were slaves, but it's important, and this is actually the emphasis. It's not, it's not just, they weren't just slaves as the emphasis here, but they were actually treated really well, and they were actually uh, sort of the best, the brightest, the most beautiful from Jerusalem, and they were treated as such. Um, here's what's happening. Nebuchadnezzar knows what he's doing. I mean, if you have all these people that are pretty educated, and they're bright, and they're tra- well-trained, and you've got a kingdom elsewhere, the worst thing that maybe you could do with them is just kill them off. Instead, what Nebuchadnezzar's thinking is, oh, I can use them in my court for my ends, for my purposes. Okay, so let's not wipe out these able-bodied, well-educated folk. Let's retrain them. Okay, so one of the things you hear in there is that he teaches them the language, right? Uh, he teaches them maybe the, the cuneiform of, his, of their place, Sumerian, Akkadian. They could study the, the Babylonian flood myths, the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Code of Hammurabi. The, they could study the texts, their religious texts, texts of great gods like the great god Marduk. Um, they probably learned some really amazing things. I don't know if you know this, but ba- the Babylonians were the first uh, people that we know of to use aqueducts. And one of the great wonders of the ancient world were the hanging gardens in Babylon. So maybe Daniel and his friends were actually learning amazing uh, feats of engineering and how those things came about. Um, you might know this, but it's the Babylonians that gave us the base unit 60 and understood that 60 seconds were in a minute and 60 minutes were in an hour and sort of mapped out that sort of initial time frame. They also figured that 360 is the circumference, uh, the unit of circumference. Here's what I'm suggesting to you. Nebuchadnezzar knew what he was doing. He totally knew what he was doing. He was going to take these guys, he was going to train them, he was going to use them. He was going to assimilate them completely into Babylonians. Um, Now, here's what's going on, though. Okay, so back in Jerusalem, you've got this crazy king, Jehoiakim. You've got, um, you know, your city's being besieged. You've already got the 10 northern tribes who were totally decimated 118 years earlier. And you're looking back at that place, and you're thinking, God's gone, the king, you know, the king's a wreck, all this is happening. Wow, look at my life in Babylon. I mean, this is looking pretty nice right now. Okay, so they receive new names. It says the chief unit gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. And we know this, right, that names have consequences. Names have consequences. They tell you about who you are. Um, names tell us about our ethnic background, sometimes our social background, our educational background. Um, Many families, as you know, probably many of your families, changed their names when they came to the United States, maybe through Ellis Island or somewhere else. They changed their names because they knew that their names uh, would have consequence on their current life. Um, Let me share with you some sort of famous names whose names were changed. Um, Whoopi Goldberg was Karen Johnson. Whoopi Goldberg is such a great name. I mean, she chose wisely there, right? Like, I wonder if her career is largely because what a great name. Um... Terry Jean Bolette, he changed his name to Hulk Hogan. That's pretty tough, Hulk Hogan. Terry Jean Bolette's like, it's French. It's not that tough. And I love French. So. For you who are watching and don't know that, I'm not knocking the French. Um, Kirk Douglas was born Isur Danielovich Demski. Fred Astaire was Frederick Austerlitz. Bruno Mars was Peter Jean Hernandez. 
not as cool as Bruno Mars. And that's a great first name, Peter. Um, Stevie Wonder. Stevie Wonder was Steve Land Junkin, Judkins. I mean, Stevie Wonder, it just sells. We know that our names have consequence in the world. Names are more than just names. Um, as a friend pastor of mine, uh, Doug Servant, said, they're identities. Names are actually give, give you a sense of identity. It's who you are. Uh, this friend who used to do RUF with me, he, he went on to say, so what if your name is Christian and you get rechristened success or beauty or 4.0 or success or vixen or scholar or 40 under 40 or wife or mom or husband or father or stud or good girl or bad girl or wasted effort or trophy or sugar daddy or funny guy class clown or most likely to succeed? Saying that your name is part of your identity. It shapes who you are. Names speak to who we want to be. Our identities can be scrambled up, right? Can be all scrambled up. But an interesting thing here in this passage is that Daniel and his friends, actually, they seem to go along with the whole name thing. They're like, yeah, new place, new name. Okay, we have, there's nothing going on there with that part of the text. It just says, oh, they got a new name. They seem to have gone along also with their education. I mean, there's no sense here in Daniel chapter 1 that they kind of go and hide and make some Christian subculture. You know, there's no, like, Christian ghetto here with the king's people. We don't have any sense of that. They're not like, uh, no, no, I can only read uh, Christian books. I can only listen to Christian music. I can only go to Christian school. Uh, all this other stuff, no. Babylonian music, Babylonian education, can't do any of it. We actually have no sense of that from this text. It seems instead that they had been listening to the prophet, of Je prophet Jeremiah when he said, seek the welfare of the city where you have been sent into exile. Pray to the Lord on, be on its behalf, for in its welfare you'll find your own. So it seems as though they're actually going along and actually seeking the welfare of the place in which they've been put. Um, again, if you were Daniel and his friends, and Jerusalem was Jerusalem at the time, right? Besieged, under attack multiple times before it finally falls. And you had this great education before you. Um, I don't even know, to be honest, if you'd be tempted to retreat into a ghetto. I mean, you're thinking, this is what happened over here with this whole nation thing. Why don't I just totally assimilate? This looks like the good life. Um, think about it like this. So most of the time, the Susquehanna is a little bit higher, right? And you know that if you get into it, as we've done on different canoe, tri canoe trips, if you get in the water and you try to stand still, you actually, it's actually very difficult, right? Um, now, right now, it's not quite the case. You can just kind of walk across, actually, almost the entire thing without getting very wet. I haven't tried, but I've seen people out there. Um, now, this is what I'm suggesting. In some ways, what they're doing right now is... It would, it would just be easy to kind of step in and just kind of be taken away with it, right? It would be sort of how the Susquehanna normally is. Just get in and float along with how things are going. And yet, they don't, do, they don't quite do that. There's still this, this story of confrontation here. There's this uh, confrontation with Daniel and his buddies and the king's food and the king's drink. Um, there's lots of ideas about why is it that Daniel and his friends won't eat the king's food and the king's drink. Maybe you've heard some of these. Um, some people say it's because the food was sacrificed to idols. That might be. Um, we know that they didn't have a refrigeration then, and so you had to get your milk, or your milk, that too probably. Uh, you had to get your meat fresh, and so you'd have to go to the place where meat was being slaughtered, and primarily the places where meat was being slaughtered were temples, you know, cows, whatnot, they'd be brought there, they'd be offered as a sacrifice, they'd be slaughtered, and then some of the meat would be sold. Uh, this discussion actually happens in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And Paul there says, follow your conscience, essentially. <laughs> and there's, so, so here, 
We have no sense, let me say this, we have no sense in this text that that's what's happening. There's no mention here of this, I can't eat this because of that. You know? There's no like, this is connected to the temple, even though we can sort of defer that it might have been. But that doesn't seem to be what Daniel's getting at here. And it's certainly not consistent with the whole of Scripture, given what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8. Okay, there's other arguments. Uh, one of the ones that I mentioned is the argument from diet. Daniel is just thinking, well, vegetables and water will make us stronger and f- fatter. Except that when you think about it, you're like, that doesn't really work that way, does it? You drink more wine than water, you will put on more weight. You drink more like fatty pieces of meat than a bunch of vegetables, you're just going to put on more weight, okay? That's just how it works. Um, the other thought here is that it's connected to the dietary laws of the Old Testament. But once again, there's nothing in this passage that's saying, and King Nebuchadnezzar loved to eat only pork, shrimp, <laughs> and other restricted animals that the Israelites weren't supposed to eat. None of that. There's just none of that. Okay. So what is happening? I mean, what's the big deal? Why make a stand here? Um, well, I think, quite honestly, the best argument is the argument from Tacos Meat Tierra. Okay? This is the argument, essentially. We're going to move here. You know, We're going to send our kids to your school. We're going to play sports. We're going to start becoming fans of some of your teams. Uh, we're going to get involved in our neighborhood associations. But we're going to eat our food because we have to stand somewhere so that we know we are not Babylonians. We worship a different God. We do not worship Marduk. We are from a different place. We are not Babylonians. We are people who long for Zion. We heard Don read to us from um, Psalm 137 saying, how can we sing the songs of Zion in a foreign land? They're saying we have to take a stand somewhere because the other option is total assimilation. Your name may be called now Balthasar, which is way harder to say than Daniel, but you're first and foremost a child of God. That's what he's saying. You may learn about civics. You may be called into politics but you have a different king. Let me put it this way. You may be registered as a Democrat or a Republican. You may work in politics, but your citizenship is first in heaven. And if there's something going on that says, this is who you are completely, then it's saying, don't go down that road. Don't go down that road. You may have all the allurements of assimilation all around you, but you're first and foremost the Lord's. Um, now, I want to say this. It's interesting to me that Daniel and his friends, um, they don't really make a big deal about this, really. Did you notice that they don't like, there's no like protest signs. There's no marches. They kind of go, I mean, in fact, it just says Daniel, really, goes to the chief of the eunuchs. And then the chief of the eunuchs kind of says, you know, I might die if you guys do that. So then it says that Daniel goes to the, uh, the steward from whom the chief of the eunuchs has assigned him. He's just kind of like, okay, here's what, I, I, I've got to take a stand here. And he's, he's sort of working the angles, learning, how do I live here? How do I learn here? How do I participate here, but still be the Lord's? Daniel finds a way to remember who he is, is what I'm saying. He finds a way to say, I am not a Babylonian. I am, I am the Lord's. Now, Um, I just think this is a deeply important text for us to wrestle with. Because the, the world that we live in wants to have us identify in so many other ways. To sort of stake our claim on certain other things. And what I don't want this to, and I think this is really important, what you shouldn't hear out of Daniel is, you know, uh, disregard the learning of the world. Don't get involved in politics and all this stuff. But what you should also learn in Daniel is they are not your primary identity. I mean, the temptation is going to be, brothers and sisters, it is going to be the next couple months to say, essentially, I am this candidate. I am that candidate. And that's largely what the world is going to be telling you. 
It is. And what it's saying is don't do it. Get involved. But remember, you are the Lord's. That is your identity. For students, you must resist uh, the lie that you are your grades. For athletes, that you are your sport. You are your good looks. You are your bank account. Or you are the mistakes that you've made in the past. That's not, that's not who you are. Uh, you must resist the image of the good life. Um, you must resist it. You must find ways, brothers and sisters, here's the thing. You must find ways right now to remind yourself that you are the Lord's. I think this is deeply important, actually, in the world that we're living in right now because we are not fellowshipping as we're meant to. We're not all gathering together as we're called to do. We're not hearing one another sing into our actual ears the gospel, right? So many in our church, and there's good reasons for this at times, but they're not hearing into their ears the preached word. They're not tasting with their tongue the sacraments. And we must do everything we can to remind one another, you are the Lord's. Because you're being told all these other things, assimilate here, assimilate there, be this. Say, no, you are the Lord's. Um, I share this with a couple of people, but I think this is really important. One of the things that I'm deeply worried about in our time is that I think we're, we're in some ways, in a, in a good way, calculating risks all the time. What is the COVID risk of going to the grocery store? What's the COVID risk of sending my kid to school? It's good, that's good, those are good questions. But there's a, there's a calculation that we need to be asking ourselves, which is, what is it doing to my soul to not be in the place and with the people who are going to remind me who I primarily am? Who I primarily am. I'm the Lord's. He names me. He calls me His. We must resist the false identities all around us. Okay. Um, finally, let me talk about benediction here. Now, y'all know, because I say this sometimes, that benediction just means a good word from the Lord. But I want to say this, that the, that the benediction in this passage is actually that God is watching over it all, and he's caring for it all. He's in charge of it all. And I want you to hear that in light of the craziness of Daniel's situation. Okay, here's the thing. It's, tempt it's tempting, and especially maybe in light of what I just said as the second point, this resistance, this uh, confrontation. It's tempting to read Daniel <clears throat> and just think, man, I need to be more like Daniel. Dare to be a Daniel. I'll tell you what, that's a common way to preach Daniel. Just, you know, mere duty, sheer discipline, moralism. That's not what's happening here. It's not what's happening here. I want you to see this, and I think it's actually pretty clear when you start to see it. At each turning point here in this chapter, there's this phrase that God gave. It's actually the same word. The gave is the same word uh, in the Hebrew here, and thankfully in this translation it's shown that. So first, I'm going to actually work from the back to the front. Verse 17, it says this. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. There's no sense in that verse that, as for these four youths, because of the vegetables and water, they were really, really bright. Or uh, these four youths, because they took a stand, it's just, and God gave. It never says, God gave because of this, this, this. It just says, God gave. God is the one who's acting here. He's the one who's watching over them in their situation, and he is giving them blessing. He is benedicting them. He's blessing them. <clears throat> um, another thing I want you to notice from this final paragraph actually here is verse 21. Verse 21 is the last verse of the, this chapter. It says this, And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. What's saying, what it's saying here is that God is watching over him. He's watching over the particularities of his life. And he actually outlives Nebuchadnezzar. 
And if you know, actually, the book of Ezra, the book of Ezra begins, it begins like this, in the first year of King Cyrus of Persia. And the book of Ezra is actually telling of the return from exile, okay? So some, one of the, we get this glimpse here that God is so in control of what's going on. He's caring for them to such an extent that Daniel actually lives through this whole time and knows of the return in the book of Ezra. So that's the first God gave. The second God gave is actually in uh, verse 9. It says this, And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And I love that God gave because it's, it seems to say that God is really in the details. He even gives um, compassion in the sight of just this one person. He's over everything. That even when you're, you're in this crazy place and people are trying to assimilate, you, God is right there. He's watching over you. He's caring for you. God knows where you are in the conflict. He knows the details of the conflict, and he can take you through it. Um, finally, once you see verse 2. Verse 2, it says this. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, Shinar to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Okay, now this is a crazy one. Like the first two God gaves that I read, 17 and 9, they're like, yeah, that's kind of nice. God's watching over us. He's giving us favor. But this is God gave Jehoiakim into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. And then actually the second clause is, and the vessels from the temple that he takes and he puts in the house of his God? I mean, this God gave is not remotely the kind of God gave that we would think of. It would be great and encouraging. The southern kingdom of Jerusalem is, is in de uh, destruction and demise, and uh, Babylon, this great military might, is taking them over, but it's God who's watching over it. God is in charge of it still. Um, and I think the really crazy thing here, actually probably the craziest thing maybe in this entire chapter here, is that God is the one, even it seems here, who's giving the vessels in a way. He's over his own vessels from his temple being brought and placed in another temple. This desecration of God's holy things. I mean, I want you to think about this, okay? This is deeply important because what's happening there, these vessels were used to worship God, right? And they're, they're in the place where God meets with his people. And now that place is being slowly taken apart. It's being slowly taken apart and taken elsewhere. Um, one commentator that I read about this passage said this, everyone would have been singing at this point, praise Marduk from whom all blessings flow. Because if the t vessels of the temple are going to be taken and desecrated, then that means that this God is no God at all. He loses is what's happening here. He's put to total shame. They would have been laughing about the God of Israel. Oh yeah, his vessels are just taken and brought to other gods. He's nothing. Don't think anything of him. This would have shown that he is not remotely in charge. God suffering, shame, God's vessels being given to another God, everyone laughing and thinking this God had completely failed. Now, um, I think this is important that we sit here for a second because as Christians, this is actually at the heart of the gospel message that we proclaim. It's right at the heart that God actually leaves his glory, right? And he goes and dwells among his enemies and he's hung on a cross and he's actually laughed at. He's mocked. And everybody thinks that God, there's nothing going on there. Dead. You follow a dead God. But that's actually the gospel message. That when we think everything is hopeless and lost, God is actually working through it all and he's bringing his redemption. I mean, Daniel's still there when King Cyrus comes to the throne. God working resurrection life through death. That's actually what's happening. It actually happens all the way through the book of Daniel. Okay, I want to uh, close with the illustration because um, I want to, again, speak to the idea that it's tempting in this book to just to look to Daniel. But God is doing something so much greater. 
Um, some of you know, and some of you remembered well, I hope, the events of 9-11 this week. I learned this week of Heather Penny. You, uh, you might have heard of her. Um, she was uh, a lieutenant in the Air Force. Uh, she f- uh, flew an F-16 on that day. Um, after the first and second crashes, you probably remember this, probably many of you remember this, um, a lot of people thought that we were at war. And there's this other plane that was headed for the Capitol. And so uh, folk there in D.C. and around D.C. Um, got ready. But of all things, this is actually unbelievable, uh, Edwards Air Force Base had no ammunition on that day. Did you know this? I, you know, maybe some of y'all know this. I just found this amazing. That there's just no ammunition for the Air Force at Edwards Air Force Base on that original 9-11. So um, Lieutenant Penny was called up by her colonel, and he said, we're going up. We're going up. I'll take the cockpit. And she replied, I'll take the tail. What they were doing is they were going to use their planes as missiles that day. I mean, reflecting on it later, she said it was a kamikaze mission. We didn't know what we were, what we, how this was going to end. Now, now, we know the story of those who were in, the, in, the, in Flight 93, right, that actually landed here in Pennsylvania. We know that, that great story. But all they knew was they were being called to faithfulness on that day to the job that they were doing. Here's what I'm suggesting to you. You're being called to faithfulness right now. You're being called to fight assimilation right now. You don't know where that's going to take you. It might seem like the most dangerous and crazy thing you've ever done. But behind the scenes, God is at work in a way that you, you could never imagine. He's protecting you in ways that you could never possibly imagine. And he will take you through. He will. Because this is not a story about Daniel. It's primarily a story about God. It's primarily a story about God and his care for his people, his faithfulness, his sustaining them, his giving them strength, and his bringing resurrection life out of death. Let me pray for us. Lord, God, I pray that as we enter into this story of the book of Daniel, that you would give us hearts that love you more and more. God, in the particularities of our lives, God, would you help us to know um, when to receive new names and when to not eat the meat? God, this takes great wisdom. Or we uh, confess that we often don't know what we're doing, but you do. God, I pray that you'd sustain us in the battle. Do your work in us, we pray, for our good and for the glory of your name. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Would you stand and we will recite the creed? Let's affirm the the faith of the church together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come again, judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer using these uh, prayers of the people here that you have printed before you. Um, I'll, I'll begin our prayer with the first um, little paragraph, and if you would uh, subsequently pray, pray paragraphs, that would be wonderful. Pray so that we can all join our voices together. We'll have some silence between each one to lift up our petitions to the Lord. Let's pray. We praise and thank you, O Lord, that you fed us with your word. Grateful for your gifts and mindful of the communion of your saints, we offer to you our prayers for all people.
of the nations in your kingdom. We pray for our country. Inspire the hearts and minds of our leaders that they, together with all our nation, may first seek your kingdom and righteousness, so that order, liberty, and peace may dwell with your people. Savior God, look upon your church and its struggle upon the earth. Have mercy on its weakness. Bring to an end its unhappy debate and scatter its fear. Look also upon the ministry of your church. Increase its courage, strengthen its faith, and inspire its witness to all people, even to the ends of the earth. author of grace and God of love. Send your Holy Spirit's blessing to your children here present. Keep our hearts and thoughts in Jesus Christ, your Son, our only Savior. Amen. Let's continue praying and ask the Lord's blessing upon our tithes and offerings. Lord in heaven, we do ask that you would um, look with favor upon us as we bring to you our, our gifts, our tithes, our offerings, our time, our talents, our whole being. Um, God, use these uh, jars of clay. Uh, fill us with your spirit to overflow uh, for the blessing of your church, to the blessing of our community, to the blessing of Harrisburg. Uh, use us, please. Bless the gifts of this church and multiply them, we ask, for your work in this world. In the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to the Lord's table, and here we are celebrating uh, this reality that God himself was desecrated, that he left his holy place uh, for us, that he gave his life, that he was mocked, that he was spat upon, and laughed at, and derided, for us. Uh, he died to bring resurrection life for us. This is the good news. This is the good news that we feast upon, that we celebrate. That Jesus' body, the body of God incarnate, would be broken for us. That his blood, the blood of the perfect spotless lamb, would be shed for us. And what we're asking the Lord to do in and through this sacrament too is to conform us to his image, his likeness, to shape himself in us because the temptation all around us is to look all other places for it. Where is our identity? In all these other places and this here, the Lord is saying, take and eat of me. Feast on me. Make me your life. So if you know Jesus, if you believe in him, that his, his mocking and his shame is for your life, if you've been baptized and you belong to him, then come and take this meal. If you don't, consider this good news, that this is what God would do for you. Brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is. We thank you, Creator God, that you made us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away, our love failing and our bodies diseased, you reached out to us again and again, providing healing, wholeness, and new life. When the flood came, you provided an ark. When the plagues came, you provided safety. When evening came, you provided a pillar of fire. When exile came, you provided a new song. Day after day after day, your love remains steadfast. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. We're going to do this sort of call and response here. Holy, holy, holy Lord. Holy, holy, holy Lord. God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. 
Blessed is he who comes. Blessed is he who comes. In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. 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 Indeed, Hosanna to our Lord in the highest. On the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and having blessed it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the supper, the Lord took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. The Apostle Paul adds that as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, that we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Therefore, let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Lord Jesus, we long for you to come again, to take us to our home, our citizenship being in heaven. God, I do pray that you would um, make in us, even this fall, a deeper longing for heaven, a deeper ache to be home with you, a a deeper self-understanding that we're pilgrims, that we're traveling through, that we're refugees, that we're longing for our home. God, we pray that you would sustain us in this time. Spirit, that you would descend upon us, that you would sanctify us for your good work in this time. Spirit, give us faith as we come to this table, as we take this bread and this wine, would it be for us the body and blood of Christ? That we would be the body of Christ redeemed by the blood of Christ? Would you pray this in the name of our Lord who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Uh, I've mentioned this before, but we're not doing communion as we typically have done where people come forward. Instead, the elements are going to be distributed to you, and when you get them, take them and hold them, and then we'll partake together. Uh, Bruce and Donna Weatherly are going to come and help distribute the elements for us.
Thanks. Brothers and sisters, our Lord, uh, for us, broke his body. Let's take and eat. And for us, his perfect, perfect blood was shed. Let's take and drink. Our great God, sustain us with yourself. That is all we need. That is what we long for. Lord, sustain us with yourself. Unite us to you more and more. Would we know the grace of God? Lord, do this in us at this time, we pray. And send us out with the good news of the gospel to this world. Now, throughout this week, and for our whole lives, would we be faithful to you, the faithful God. We ask this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now please stand and receive the benediction from the Lord. <clears throat> the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And we're going to uh, sing this song that we sang for the first time last week.
I'm not going to teach it to you again. Maybe some of you will remember it, and if not, we'll just kind of learn it as we go along. Um, hopefully some of you will remember this song. This will be a good, it's a good pilgrim song. once again from 3rd John. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. There'll be a time when we're not wearing masks, y'all. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends, each by name. Peace, Lord, be with you. Amen. Amen.